you've not been with us, you, you missed a powerful entry into the season of Lent. The 40 days that from very ancient times, Mark told us last week, the church prepares and gets ready for the resurrection of Jesus at Easter. And uh, it's a big time to get ready. It's a big time to step back, do some things differently in life. And Mark was preaching last week about diving deep, going deep into the Lenten season. And as he was preaching, I, I thought about a story. Uh, I just, he, he took me right back uh, years and years ago to the Tampa Yacht and Country Club, Ballast Point in South Tampa. My grandparents were members. My grandfather was an Episcopal priest in later life, and this was the socially prominent club to, to be a part of. So my grandparents were members of the Tampa Yacht and Country Club. Uh, my dad thought, forget that, so we never did that. But uh, because of my grandparents, I was able, my brothers were able, in the summers to learn how to swim. So from a very young age, three, four years old, uh, all the kids in South Tampa would go to this magnificent swimming uh, program all summer long. And I learned how to swim. At the Tampa Yacht Country Club, right out by the boats, there's this very large uh, pool. And there's two diving boards at one side of the pool. The short diving board and the very tall diving board. And so, after a whole summer of learning to swim, and the very two weeks of the summer, you were taught how to dive off the diving board. And then those final few beautiful days of summer, you could actually, during free time, go off the diving board. So um, uh, my very friend, I was about uh, six years old, I think, um, they, they taught me how to dive on the, uh, on the low diving board. First you start on the edge of the pool. Does anybody remember learning how to dive? You put your, lock your thumbs together like this, and you overlay one hand upon another, and you, you put your arms out like this, and you lock your elbows, and then you jump, and the idea is hands, head, and then feet come last in a beautiful knifing motion right into the water. Everybody got that image? And so you, you practice on the side of the pool, and you practice on the grass, and then you practice on the small diving board. I was doing great. Well, it was 20 steps up to the top of the large diving board. And when you're a six-year-old boy, you got to do what the eight-year-old boys do. Just, that's the way the universe works. So uh, at the end of the summer, I went up 20 steps to the top. I never noticed how high that actually is. And there's nothing else around you. You're in open space, and you start to walk out on the diving board, and it starts to kind of bounce. So you get out to the very end, and your whole world is going up and down. And 4,000 feet below you is the pole. <laughs> And so, being Scottish, I knew exactly what to do. I locked my thumbs like this, and I overlaid my hands just like I've been taught to do, and I put my arms up. I locked my elbows, and I went to jump, and my legs failed me. And I actually went just over flat, all the way down. You could hear the air whistling under my body. And all I remember is hitting a concrete slab completely flat. I saw light. I think I saw my grandfather. Uh, I, I broke my back. I, I, every bone in my body was crushed in that landing. Um, the sound, I can still hear the sound in, in my head. Um, and I went about three inches into the water. You know it's a bad pancake when everybody on the side of the pool goes, ooh. <laughs> Well, my coach jumps into the water, swims out, pulls me, I can hardly move, and he pulls me up to the side of the pool, and he looked at me in the pool, he said, Brooks, that is exactly how not to do that. <laughs> Five times I attempted that dive. And literally four times I pancaked, and it was really painful. But being Scottish, you don't stop when it hurts, you just keep going. And finally, finally, I did on my sixth dive, a true dive. I jumped off, I balanced the timing of the board. I arced. I could see my hands down in front of me and my feet were up behind me. And I knifed through that water. And I'll never forget the feeling. 
It's one of the most beautiful feelings that you can have in water. And I went down just like you're supposed to. And that water was, uh, was soft. It, it, it enveloped me. It was a beautiful feeling. And I finally got it out of dive. But you had to break the surface and go deep. Mark's preaching last week, and all I could think about was that moment when I broke the surface of the water. And it was a beautiful moment, and I went deep, and I got it. And I tell you that story because Lent is a time to go deep. It's a time to break the surface of the lives that we're leading. It's a time to not dive shallow. Because when we live life shallow, when we pancake, <clears throat> it can be extraordinarily painful. And I think so many people in the season of Lent experience pain without going deep. So I, I, I'm challenging us this morning, in this 40 days before Easter, to, to knife through that threshold, to go deep, as Mark was preaching about. The first thing we need to do in the season of Lent to do that is to acknowledge the reality of that surface that we live on. It's a word that Episcopalians don't hear very often. It's a word that's embedded in every other line of the readings. You don't see the word printed, but it's there. Everybody get ready. The word is sin. Now, we're not Baptist, so let me just say the word again. If you're from Texas, it's sin. No. With that end, right? Sin. No. But if you're not from sin, everybody know the word? You know the word, right? This companions never, ever hear this word. I never hear a sermon preached about sin. My God, we have relatives here, and you're going to hear a sermon about sin? And the answer is absolutely. Because if we don't understand the world that we're living in, we will always be flattened on the top of the water. You see, uh, that first moment, the Bible says, when Adam and Eve was given everything, everything that they needed, there was no work. They were going to live forever. We're designed to go a long time. And in that one moment, like good Episcopalians, Adam and Eve do the one thing that God has said not to do. Does anybody remember this in the, in the Old Testament? Can, can you tell me why they picked the tree? We're not in Sunday school. You're here. So I'm not looking for a Sunday school. I'm looking for something a little deeper, and they just disobeyed. Do you anybody remember for extra Bible points, why did Adam and Eve uh, pick the fruit off that tree, both of them together, and eat it when God said not to? Does anybody remember why? The serpent said, if you pick that fruit, you'll know what God knows. And as a matter of fact, you can do it better than God. I mean, you, you, know, the, you know the Adam and Eve uh, uh, business model, right? If you don't do it, it's not going to be done well. Because only you can do it well. Only I can do it well. I mean, God can really use our help in this world, right? I mean, if I was in charge, boy, things would be a whole lot better. I mean, why, why, is, why do all these things happen in this world? I don't understand. And if I had ten minutes of God's power, then everything would be right. And Florida State would be national champions year after year after year. Adam and Eve took that fruit to say, I'm going to step in between God and His creation. I know the plan, and I can do the best. <clears throat> and it's in that moment, the Bible says, that everything changes. Death enters. We, we weren't designed to die, and yet now we do. Adam and Eve start to argue. Having children all of a sudden is profoundly difficult. Adam has to work hard all the time, and then he dies. The whole world changes at that moment, and sin enters the human experience. It's not evil. That's something different. Sin is an infection that we are given. It's rebellion against God. The word for sin in the Bible is a word that archers use to hit the center of a target. Has anybody ever done archery? And that was the other summer at the Tampiotta Country Club. I almost hit my brother. It was glorious. So you, you shoot the arrow towards the target, and it goes over here. Oh, no, no, no. I meant for it to hit. I'm going to hit Right, it goes over there. You want to hit the target, but it just goes every other way. 
This is the biblical word for sin. And that's what happens in a world where we think we know best. And so to be human is not to be evil. Don't let anybody tell you that Bible doesn't say that. To be human means that we are born with this proclivity to mess things up and rebel against God. Lent is a great time to reflect on sin. Abram, in the first reading, Father Abraham, the founder of three world faiths, over half the souls in the global family derive their religion from this man. He's changed the history of the world, period. Abram is told by God that he is going to be the father of a great nation. That he is going to be blessed with descendants that are going to live in what we call the Holy Land. Everybody with me in the reading this morning? Right? And what does Abram say to God? You've got to be kidding me. I don't even have children. He said, the only heir I have is Eliezer of Damascus. And Damascus is not a very good neighborhood. Abram says, God, you don't understand my life. And God says, pardon me. Do you think you know what's about to happen in your life, Abram? Have you got it all worked out? You know how it's going to all lay out, don't you, Abram? Let me tell you, you don't know anything. Why don't you get some animals, Abram, right now, and you're going to sacrifice as if you were just welcoming the birth of a child, even though it hasn't even happened. And the Bible says a great dread fell on Abram. Like every man walking out of the labor and delivery ward. Abram looks just like that, like a truck hitting, like a great dread, like something's happening. I'll figure it out 15 years from now. And God says, do not, to Abram, do not tell me that you know your own plan. I have a plan. Sin is thinking that we actually are in control and that we have a plan. And God says, you have no idea the plans I have for you. If there's anybody here that thinks that you've got it, that I've got it, all really wrapped up, let me introduce you to the father of three world faiths that did not understand the same lesson. God had to teach Abram that to think that we're in control is the essence of sin. We're not. I sat with a good friend this week who said, as things are happening in life, how do I respond? None of this is what I planned. And I said, yes, that's right. Why don't we pray about what's happening? Now we turn to St. Paul in our second reading. And Paul says something very interesting. <clears throat> he's preaching and teaching to a church he's founded. And then Paul says to his church, there's only two kinds of people. The people that are moving towards God and the people that are moving away from God. And the people moving away from God, he calls enemies of Christ. It's a very strong term. And he said, if you're moving towards God, you're waiting for a Savior. Our eyes are lifted up. We're waiting, we're praying, we're hoping to see Jesus in life right now. And he says, the people that are enemies of Christ, this is very harsh language. He said, their God is right here. It's easy for me to point to this. He said, their God is the belly. In the Greek world, everything that was beautiful was in the mind. And everything that was horrible was right here in the belly. And Paul says, they're worshiping the very thing that is killing them. He says, if you turn away from God, you will always find the thing that will destroy you. You will always find the very thing that will tear you down. Let me tell you that in a family where alcoholism has been so ravaging, and in my ministry to alcoholics, when things get really bad, I always find it kind of strange. What do alcoholics do when things are bad? They drink more because that's going to make it better, right? When I was a student chaplain at Duke University Medical Center, do you know the department that had the heaviest rate of chain smokers in the entire hospital? Duke University Medical Center, one of the best medical centers in the country. Who chain smoked the most out of any department? Can anybody guess? 
the cancer ward, the oncology ward. <clears throat> they would treat people with lung cancer and go out and smoke during their breaks. Now, what are you doing? It's the thing that we're drawn to that destroys us. When we turn away from God, Paul says there's only one destination easy to find on me. And he said, it will always destroy you. This is how sin works. This is exactly how it works. Paul said, for everybody, whether you're Christian or not, that's the way it works. Then we come into the New Testament reading. I found you a beautiful picture of a model of Jerusalem in the first century. Uh, it's on the cover of the bulletin. I love these pictures. I've seen, some of you may have seen this model. It's actually about a third of this room in size in Jerusalem. When you go to Jerusalem, you must see it. <clears throat> and Jesus is looking from this perspective. I found the same perspective that Jesus was actually seeing when he was saying the words in the gospel today. He's looking out over that beautiful temple that Herod constructed, beautiful second temple in Jerusalem, and his heart starts to break. He starts to weep. You can hear it in the text of the gospel. Oh, Jerusalem, he says, Jerusalem. Every He's speaking with God's voice, first person. Every prophet I ever sent you to teach you about God, you have executed. You will never see God face to face, Jerusalem, unless you say, here is the one that the Lord is sending. This was about four decades before the 10th legion of the army of Rome under Titus's direction spent eight years pulling stone by stone down from the picture that you were looking at. The Romans loved destroying the temple where the Jews thought God was physically present. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And it literally broke his heart. And he started to weep. Sin is present not just in the human heart, not just in relationships. It's present in every structure that we make. If we touch it, it's going to have the capacity to fall and break and rebel against God. Can you show me a world today where we might see sin present in human society? If anybody wants to, Mark talked about the gift of tears last week as being a Lenten discipline. There might be a, a healthy moment in Lent where we literally break down and cry because there are some things worth crying about in the world today. This is not the world that God intended. This is going a little bit deeper. And so we see sin present in the heart, in the belly, in our world. And I just want to ask you as I close, how deep have you dove into the Lenten season? How far have you gone? Are you find yourself, sometimes I find myself pancaking on the surface of, of reality. I don't want to go deep. I don't want to examine this. I don't want to step back. It's just so easy to just keep going day after day after day. And God says, don't be there. I have such a plan for you. If you dive deep, what's waiting there is God's unbelievable grace and blessing. Sin never has the final word. That's why we get to Easter. That's what the Christian message is all about. Sin never speaks the final word, ever. That is reserved for God, period. May I ask, as I ask myself, if there was one part of a burden today that God could take from our shoulders, if there was one part of a rebellion that we are participating in that God could remove, what would that be? If there was one thing that we could ask God to heal, or fix, or mend, or strengthen, or transform, what would that one thing be? Not the surface. I'm talking the bottom end of the pool. Lent is a time to ask God that question. To pray that God would remove the sin that the Bible says sticks to us. 
I am not in this church because I'm a good person. I'm not a priest because I'm a good person. I'm actually not. Some people come to church to be a good person. You're in the wrong place. The Rotary Club is a great place to make a good person better. Sometimes golf can do that every once in a while. There are a lot of places to be better people. That's not why we're here. We're here because God takes broken people and makes them whole. We're here because God can remove the sin that sticks to our lives. If God could remove one thing today, what would it be? And why not ask Him to do that very thing and dive deeply into the waters of His grace? In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.